G'day guys, in this video I'm going to formally derive for you the equation of motion for a spring mass system. So to do this, let's consider that we have a mass just here connected to a spring. Now the way we find the equation of motion is we consider what this mass looks like at some arbitrary time t during its oscillation. So at some time t, let's say this block is at a position x from its equilibrium position. Now it turns out this is all we need to draw a free body diagram of what's going on. So let's get started. This is our free body diagram. Now of course there will be vertical forces on this thing. We'll have, a, we'll have our force due to gravity and our normal force. But what's most interesting is we will have a spring force acting on this block towards the left. Notice, if the block is over here at some time t, that means the spring has been stretched, which means the spring force must be applying a force back towards the left, right? And we know from Hooke's law, the magnitude of this force is kx, okay? So that's a force in the x direction. Are there any others? Well, we could include friction, but we're going to assume that this floor is frictionless just here, okay? Now let's apply F equals MA in the X direction. We know that the sum of forces acting on a body, in this case in the X direction, is equal to your mass of your body times by your acceleration, in this case in the X direction. Now what's the sum of forces? Well, we only have one and it's going to be minus KX. It's minus because it's towards the left. And that's going to be equal to your mass times by your acceleration but your acceleration can be written as your double derivative of your displacement. So we're going to write this as x double dot just here. And so if you rearrange this equation, you can tell that finding the equation of motion will boil down into solving mx double dot plus kx is equal to zero, which is a second order differential equation. So let's try and solve this guy to find the generalized equation of motion. Let's try and solve the equation x double dot plus k on m, x is equal to zero. All right, well, to solve this differential equation, what we need to do is we need to guess a solution for x. So let's guess that x equals e to the lambda t, where lambda is a constant, is a solution to this differential equation just here. And this might seem quite arbitrary, especially considering we could have made other selections like cosine and sine, which would have worked just fine too, right? But this will work, I promise you, and, in fact, this is a very powerful way to solve differential equations, which I'm going to use in future videos, too. Okay? So if we go ahead with this guess, how can we plug this into here? Well, we'll need to find the double derivative of this guy, so let's do it bit by bit. We know that the first derivative will be lambda e to the lambda t, because lambda is a constant. And x double dot will be lambda squared e to the lambda t, just here. Okay? So let's plug this into here and see what happens we're gonna get lambda squared e to the lambda t plus k on m times e to the lambda t is gonna be equal to zero. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna factor out an e to the lambda t just here. We're gonna write this as e to the lambda t times by lambda squared plus k on m must be equal to zero. So it seems we can go down two roots. We can say that either e to the lambda t is equal to zero or this beast here must be equal to zero. But notice, e to the lambda t can never be equal to zero, right? I dare you, find a value of lambda such that this can be equal to zero. You won't be able to do it, right? Which means we've only got one option. This beast right here must be equal to zero. So lambda squared plus k on m must be equal to zero. And if you solve for lambda, that means that lambda must be equal to plus or minus the square root of minus k on m, right? Which is interesting because that means from this negative square root sign that you're dealing with complex numbers. So that means that lambda has two values. It's plus or minus the square root of k on m times by the imaginary constant i, or if you're an engineer, you usually write it as j, the square root of minus one. So what this shows us now is there's actually two values for lambda such that this guess holds true in this differential equation. So let me break this up to you. We're basically saying that there's two possible solutions. We can say that x equals e to the plus square root of k on m j t is a solution and x equals e to the minus the square root of k on m 
JT are solutions. Solutions. So we found two possible solutions to this differential equation. But what is the generalized solution? Well, it turns out we can apply the superposition theorem. We know from the superposition theorem that the generalized solution is going to be some constant a times e to the plus square root k on m j t plus another constant b times e to the minus square root k on m j t like this. Notice that this equation must also satisfy this differential equation. Now, if you don't believe me, you can plug this in and see for yourself. But what I want to focus on from this differential equation right now is the fact that we still have complex exponents just here and the constants a and b can also be complex, right? Even if a and b are complex, they still satisfy this equation. So let me write this down here. It means that a and b can be in the complex domain just here. And we're going to use this fact later on in our derivation. So let's see, how can we simplify this any further? Well, it turns out all we need to do is we need to use Euler's formula. Euler's famous formula states that e to the j theta is going to be equal to cosine theta plus j sine theta. And so what I can do is I can expand out each of these terms separately. So let's do that. This is going to show that x is going to be equal to a times by cosine times the square root of k on mt plus a j sine times the square root of k on mt. And now let's deal with this guy. It's going to be plus b cosine minus the square root of k on mt plus b j times by sine minus the square root of k on mt, like this. So this is another expression for our generalized solution to this differential equation just here. So it seems like we're stuck and we can't simplify this formula any further. But rest assured, we can use a trigonometry formula. We can show that cosine of minus theta is going to be equal to cosine theta. And we can use the fact that sine of minus theta is equal to minus sine of theta like this. And we can use this to make sure that all the arguments here are the same as the arguments in here. So let's do that. And I'm just going to jump the gun. I'm going to make that substitution and I'm going to group the cosines and sines together. So if we group the cosines together, we're going to get cosine times the square root of k on mt all times by a, um, let's see, plus b. Notice that this will just become b cosine times the square root of k on mt. Now let's group the sines together. We can add this to sine of the square root of k on mt all times by, let's see, it'll be a j here, and then this will become minus, when you bring that minus out here, minus b j there. And so interestingly, it looks like everything boils down into cosine times a constant plus sine times another constant. And we can simplify this even more by using yet another trigonometry substitution. We know that c1 times by cosine theta plus c2 times by sine theta can be written as the square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared times by sine um, theta plus inverse tan of c1 divided by c2. Now what's so important about this expression just here is it shows that our answer can be written in the form of some constant times by sine theta plus another constant. So let's write that in. It shows that x can be written as some constant, which I'm going to call a, notice I'm redefining a, times by sine of the square root of k on mt plus another constant, which I will call phi subscript one. Now you might be asking, well, hold on, couldn't a and phi one be complex? Well, in fact, they could be based off this derivation since we're dealing with j's here. However, it will depend on our initial conditions. And I promise you for realistic initial conditions, these values will always be real. Now, before I end this video, I want to introduce something to you. I want to define a new term omega n as being the square root 
of k on m like this. And so when we plug this definition into here, we get x is going to be equal to a times by sine omega nt plus phi 1. Now what's important about this answer right now is that omega n, which we just defined as the square root of k on m, turns out to be the coefficient of time, which means it has properties of frequency, which is why it's given the special name natural angular frequency. Now it's called natural because it doesn't involve damping. It's the frequency when there is no damping. And it's called angular to differentiate it from regular frequency because this is in terms of radians per second, whereas regular frequency is in terms of cycles per second or hertz. But what I want to hammer down is this is your generalized equation of motion where omega n dictates the frequency of your block when there is no damping on your system. I hope that made sense, guys. I'm going to be covering a few example problems now. Cheers.